where he sits all the way down. That'd make it easier for him. <coughs> My uh, pitch pipe is gone, so if it's up or down, well, just hang with me and we'll figure it out. Stand up, stand up for Jesus.
assume I'm not many of us knew that I walked with King. All right. I, that's one thing I love about the congregation here. It doesn't matter if we know it or not. You're just going to flow right along with us, and it sounds good at the end. Invitation song is number 760, if you use the book, 760. Song before the lesson is uh, 726, and if you want to go ahead and stand for that, we're going to sing all four verses on this one. It's kind of a song that builds, and uh, it's kind of hard to leave and uh, verse out on a certain song. <clears throat> we saw the night when thou didst come to this poor world of sin. and hold them up high. It's good to see everybody here uh, tonight. Uh, you will be looking around the room, I'm sure, and if you uh, uh, see a few of us wearing uh, the new youth group t-shirts, uh, there's a couple of us besides me uh, out there uh, proudly supporting those and wearing those. Uh, we want to uh, uh, 
uh, thank those who uh, made contributions toward those t-shirts. If you have not, as was mentioned already, announced earlier uh, tonight, if you have not received your youth group t-shirt, uh, there's a few of, uh, of you who have not because you're not here with us to actually get those. Uh, but uh, please make sure that uh, you uh, see me or Taylor. Uh, Taylor's not here, so you can see me. Um, and we'll make sure that you get those. And uh, again, we, uh, we thank you for... Uh, wearing those and uh, for those who have uh, uh, supported our youth group uh, through the years, uh, especially now as uh, Taylor takes on uh, that task. Speaking of our young people, uh, there's a great program that's getting started. I'm almost uh, as excited, if not a little more so, uh, than uh, those who are actually uh, in the age group, but uh, our young people up through about the fourth grade. Uh, we're getting back into something called Pew Packers. Anybody know what Pew Packers is? Most people, some, maybe not quite sure. It's, uh, it's a program geared, it, it's like a 10-minute vacation Bible school program that happens on the front pews of the church. And it's going to start uh, this next Sunday evening uh, at 5 o'clock. We're going to dedicate the first 10 minutes or so. Uh, of our service time to uh, uh, those who are up through about the fourth grade. So parents, uh, if you uh, are interested in that, and I hope you are, uh, we're going to have a real quick meeting tonight right after church on the front row. Uh, if you have your young'uns with you, uh, you can bring them down. And I know Richard, myself, will try to explain it, uh, build you up, encourage you, get you as excited as we are. But that's a really good program. Just curious. Just just. Want, want, want to know, honestly, raise your hand, if tonight, if I were to put you on the spot, could you say all the books of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation without missing one? Raise your hand. Three, four. All right. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about this Pew Packer class, and y'all are going to learn because you're going to be in here, because it'll be worship time, but we're going to dedicate those first 10 minutes, and you're going to learn those books of the Bible, whether you realize it or not. By the time those young people uh, can, can quote all 66 books from Genesis uh, to Malachi, from Matthew to Revelation, uh, you will be able to do it as well if you pay attention. So I'm excited. I don't know about you, but... Uh, um, if you want to be a part of that meeting tonight, even if you don't have any little people uh, in, in that age group, but you're just curious, uh, just come on down. We'll have a great uh, meeting. I want to share this with you. If you will, go ahead and be turning uh, in your Bibles to a Matthew chapter 28. Uh, tonight we're going to kind of continue. We talked about the, um, the reactions, the responses uh, to uh, some, some of those who encountered Jesus being raised from the dead. We, we touched on uh, many of those this morning, but tonight we're going to focus on some of the, some of the actions, uh, some, some of the other things we did not get to uh, this morning that are fascinating, uh, at least to me. Uh, but I want to begin with this. As you're turning to Matthew chapter 28, we'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, but this was something that was uh, shared with me on Facebook recently. Uh, uh, when you really think about it, uh, it says, If you fail, never give up. Because fail, F-A-I-L, means first attempt in learning. Fail, first attempt in learning. End, E-N-D, is not the end. In fact, end, E-N-D, means effort never dies. If you get no as an answer, remember no, N-O, means next opportunity. So the bottom line is change your mindset, change your perspective. Fail is not always failure. No is not always no. End is not always the end. Uh, but it can be a certainly, certainly can be a great place to start and to uh, learn uh, from that. So Sometimes in life we have to change our mindset, don't we? Change our perspective, change our, our attitude because it's very easy to get negative and down and discouraged and frustrated with, with all of life that's going on. So sometimes we have to change uh, the way that we uh, view certain things and look at life uh, in general as a whole. This morning in our lesson, we looked at uh, the response to and the reactions to Jesus being alive. That is joy and celebration and rejoicing or worship. We talked about some of the doubts and the unbelief and even the fear that many of the disciples, those uh, with them, experienced. 
We talked a little bit about how sometimes uh, God would restrain them from being able to recognize who Jesus was. But as Jesus interacted with them and showed uh, himself, they, they did recognize and remember and they knew uh, that it was indeed Jesus. Well, tonight, I want to look at some of the actions, uh, some, some of the um, responses and reactions as far as what people did. What, what they did not do and, and how their encounter uh, with Jesus uh, unfolded. And I want to begin tonight uh, with uh, the bribery and the lies. And here in Matthew chapter 28, it's almost like a soap opera if you really want to think about it like that. It's almost like a soap opera that, that unfolds the, the ebb and the flow of, of the story of Jesus from the beginning to, to the end. It's almost like a, like a soap opera. But here in the end of Matthew chapter 28, beginning in verse number 11, the soldiers that are coming back from, uh, the, from the tomb, they come back into the city, and they are going to be they're going to be bribed. They're going to be offered a large sum of money to tell lies about Jesus. It's just very interesting to think about this. Matthew 28, read with me starting at verse number 11. Now while they were going... Behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priest all the things that had happened. Verse 12. When they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, Tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while he slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears... We will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Wow, that's kind of, that's interesting. That's, that's, that, that's fascinating to me that these, these guard, these soldiers come back into the city. And, and that... That they tell this report, they give a report of all that's happened, and the chief priests, the, the elders of the city come together and they come up with a plan, if you can call it a plan. But their 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 thinking is we're gonna offer these guard money, a large sum of money. We're gonna bribe them, pay them off to tell lies. How many of you ever heard of the witness protection program? You get in trouble and you maybe uh, uh, are called to uh, uh, give your testimony and the one that you're going to give testimony against is maybe high-powered and, and wealthy and has connections and you might be in danger. So a lot of times they may decide to, to put you in witness protection after that trial or during the trial, give you a whole new identity. You know, that's really not anything new. It happened back then. We just read about witness protection. I mean, go back here, if you will, to uh, verse 14. So they've been, these guard have been given the instructions on what they are uh, to do, the, the lie that they are to tell. Verse 13, tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while he slept. Verse 14 says, and if this comes to the governor's ears, if the governor gets wind of what we're doing and what we've instructed you to do and paid you to do, if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. Witness, witness protection. And so this is unfolding and this is what happens. They were being bribed to lie about what actually happened. To, to tell that, that the disciples came and they, they rolled the stone away. They have stolen the body of Jesus while he was asleep. And so they were being paid to, to tell this lie. And I got to thinking about a few things. What about us? Have, have we, like these guard, or even like Judas, you remember Judas was bought at the price of 30 pieces of silver to betray Christ. What about you and me? Have, have we been bribed by the world? Have, have we sold Jesus out? Have we made an exchange maybe with the enemy? Take a moment and go to Mark chapter 8 for just a moment. Mark chapter 8 and verse number, number 36. It's very easy to do this if we're not careful. Mark chapter 8 beginning in verse 36, a very familiar scripture. 
Jesus says, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? That exchange happens quite often. But I got to thinking, are we like these guards willing to lie or believe a lie or, or help propagate uh, a lie about, about Jesus, about the Word of God, or about living the Christian life? You know, you can tell a lie without speaking words, right? You don't have to say any words and you can still be guilty of lying. It's called hypocrisy. Of living one way on Sunday morning, but then Monday through Saturday living a completely different way. So we have to be careful. You don't have to use your words to tell a lie, but we can become hypocrites by the way that we live our lives. So the bribery here in Matthew 28, the, the lies that are, are being told, that's a bad response. Actions that are not good obviously but what about us what about us can we be bought what's your price Judas had a price and you remember 30 pieces of silver not very much and remember what happened when Judas remembered and understood what he had done that that he was guilty of of uh, turning an innocent man over what did he do with that money you remember basically threw it back at their feet and he went out and hung himself What's our price? Do we have a price? We need to be careful. Because Satan will use anyone and anything to uh, deceive us and to destroy us. I shared this one this morning a little bit. As we look more at the ending of Matthew 28 and uh, Mark chapter 16 or Luke chapter 24, even in John chapter 20 and 21, these, these last uh, chapters of these uh, gospel accounts shed a lot of light, literally. And there's a lot of what I would consider deja vu moments. Mo moments when, when individuals are thinking, I've heard that before. I've I've seen that before. I've encountered a very similar experience. You understand what deja vu is? It's, it's when, when you experience something very similar beforehand. Now, I'm going to tell you how crazy my mind works. I was thinking, and maybe you've experienced this as well. How many of you have ever had a very detailed, specific dream that you remember? Very vivid dream. You remember? You remember maybe what you were wearing? You dreamed about the, the other people and the circumstances that were going on? And then about two weeks later, you experience the dream that you had two weeks early. You ever dream something like that and it happens? It's kind of weird. I don't know if you're willing to fess up to that, but I have. It, it kind of makes you go, what? I remember that. And you're racking your mind, where, where, where did I think of that? Or, and you go, wait a minute, I dreamed that. I dreamed that very thing, and then two or three weeks later, a month later, it works out. Just like you dreamed. It's creepy. I mean, it's weird how that stuff sometimes works. But that's where I was thinking about this deja vu. These, these disciples on many occasions realize, hey, I've heard that before from Jesus. I've experienced this before. And almost a light bulb uh, comes off. Let me show you what I'm talking about. I get worked up, y'all. I'm sorry. Luke chapter 24. If you go to Luke chapter 24, this is just really, really neat. Luke chapter 24, on the road to Emmaus, after Jesus has joined themselves, uh, himself with these two, and they're walking and they're talking, beginning in verse number 30. Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse number, number 30. Listen to what it says. Now it came to pass as they sat at the table with them that he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Can you already feel a sense of deja vu if you were there? He's breaking bread, he's blessed it, and now he's sharing it with them. Then their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? So they arose up early that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Verse 35. 
And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Now, what's the, what's, what's the, what's the deja vu moment here? You remember in Matthew chapter 26 when Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper and he uses the, the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine? No doubt that had to have been something that they were like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. He's done this before. We've experienced this same situation before. And so back up there in Luke chapter 24, verse number 30, when he was at the table with them, that he took bread, he blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them they had to be like, wait a minute. This is Jesus. He, he's done this before. And so their eyes were opened and, and they knew it was Jesus. Let me show you another instance. Go over to John chapter 21. John chapter 21 is just fascinating for a whole lot of reasons. Besides the fact that Jesus is on the beach and he's done made breakfast for them. That had to have been a neat encounter. Have Jesus cook breakfast for you but but in John chapter 21 look with me at verse number number three John chapter 21 verse 3 beginning Simon Peter said to them I am going fishing that sounds like something a fisherman might say Dennis and I say it all the time I just asked him tonight are we going fishing tomorrow oh yep we're going fishing tomorrow so I like Peter I'm going fishing well Simon Peter said I am going fishing well they said to him we're going with you also they went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Kind of starting to remember something that happened with these guys before. Verse 4, But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? They answered him, No. Jesus wants to know if they've caught any fish yet. All right, so verse 6. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. So apparently, they'd been fishing on the left side of the boat. On the wrong side, I guess, with Jesus. Jesus said, throw that net, cast your net on, on the other side. Doesn't it remind you of another scene? No doubt these fishermen had experienced nearly the same thing earlier. And here's this deja vu moment. Go to Luke chapter 5 for just a second. Luke chapter 5. This is just some pretty interesting things here. Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse number, number 4. This is neat here because Jesus actually uses a boat as a pulpit, a podium, if you will. Luke, Luke chapter 5, beginning uh, in verse uh, uh, number 3. Verse 3 says, Then he, Jesus, got into one of the boats. The fishermen there, they were away washing their nets. All right, so he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out, launch out a little bit from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. That's a pretty big crowd when you've got to get into a boat to get offshore a little bit while the crowd is right there, no doubt, along the shoreline. But verse number 4 says, And when he stopped speaking... He to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your net for a catch. Now remember what occupation did Peter have? He was a fisherman. Very experienced fisherman. How would you like being told how to go fishing by somebody who was not a fisherman? That'd be like me telling Dennis how to go fishing and what to do. He's the expert, not me. I'm just the little peon in the boat that's hoping not to fall out. But Peter, Peter's told by Jesus, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Listen to what Simon Peter says, verse 5. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night long. We've been fishing all night and caught nothing. Sounds like some of the fishing trips me and Dennis have been on almost. We've caught nothing. We've toiled and fished all night but caught nothing. I love the next word. New King James, next word. Nevertheless, Peter's saying, Lord, this is what we've done. Master, we have fished and toiled all night and caught zero. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. Talk about faith and trust, obedience. Okay, here he goes. Verse 6, and when they had done this, 
They caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. Can you imagine how Peter and the other guys must have felt knowing they have toiled and worked and fished all night and caught nothing? And now here's Jesus. He's just finished preaching and he's told them to launch out back into the deep and to let down their nets on the other side and wham! Those nets are so full they're just about to bust. You go back to John chapter 21 where we were. As they're, they're, they're casting their nets. Jesus says, do you have any food? Have you caught any fish? No. Try the other side. And I want you to go back to John chapter 21 and look with me at verse number 7. John 21 and verse number number 7. All right, so, so he's told them to cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some in verse number, number 6. So they cast and now they were not able to draw it in but of the multitude of fish. Deja vu. Almost literally the same experience. Verse number 7. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Baloop. It's him. From the shore, they knew it was him. And what did Peter do? Simon Peter, when he heard it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and he plunged into the sea. He's jumping out of this boat, and he's making his way back to the shore because it is Jesus. But the other disciples, verse 8, the other disciples came to the little boat, for they were not far from the land, about 200 cubits, about 300 feet or so, about the length of a football field maybe. They were dragging the net that was filled with fish. Verse 9, Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net uh, to land full of large fish. Now this is fascinating. Scripture tells us exactly how many fish there were. One hundred and fifty-three. So knowing that, what do you know that they had done? They'd open up them nets there on the beach. No doubt they're sorting them and they're counting. They're counting out all these fish. A hundred and fifty-three large fish. I wonder what they did with those small ones, Dennis. Me and Dennis from time to time, we'll catch these little bass at about three ounces, four ounces, five ounces. They drive you crazy. They hit that lure so hard you think you got a five-pounder on the end of it sometimes. But it says 153 large fish. And it says, and though there were so many, their nets were not broken. We're not going to get into the breakfast scene and how Peter's reinstated. But it's fascinating. No, no doubt these guys remembered that first fishing trip. Toiled all night, caught nothing. But yet Jesus says, throw your net on the other side. And big old net full of fish. And now back here in John 20, 21, Jesus calls out to them from the shoreline, have you caught anything? Children, do you have any food? No. And what did he say again? Throw on the other side. Cast on, cast on the other side. You know, it's fascinating to me, amazing to me, how God works uh, in our lives. And sometimes we, we look back over our lives and we see where God has worked uh, some situations out. And we, we think and we look up maybe and we say, God, I know that was you. God, I know that was you. It had to be you. Uh, Ashlyn sometimes will say over a certain situation like that, she'll say, look at God. Look at God. Look at God at work. Look at what God uh, has done. And that's exactly, no doubt, what's going on, on here. Let's move ahead. There's another fascinating thing here. Jesus would open their eyes. Their eyes would be open to where they would recognize and know that, yes, this is Jesus. But he would also explain the scriptures to them. He, he would expound uh, the scriptures to them. Now, I just want to show you a little bit of that. Since we're here uh, in, uh, let's go to Luke chapter 24 for just a moment. Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse number 25. Luke chapter 24, uh, verse number, number 25, back to the Emmaus Road as these disciples are talking and talking. Jesus has joined uh, with them. 
And they've had their conversation beginning there in verse 19 down to verse 24. Verse number 25 of Luke chapter 24. Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory? I like verse number 27. Luke 24, verse 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, minor and major, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. What a sermon. What a Bible class that must have been. Right there. For Jesus, God in the flesh, to, to open up and to expound and to explain to them, starting with Moses and all the way through, things about himself. Look at verse number 32. Same, same chapter, Luke chapter 24, verse number 32. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? A little bit further down, verse 44. Luke 24, verse 44. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Verse, those two verses there. He opened their eyes, opened their understanding, explained and expounded uh, the word of God, the scriptures, that were about him, about Jesus. So they would better and fully understand. Kind of reminded me of what Jesus said in John 8 and verse 32. And you shall know the truth, the truth shall make you free. That, that's what God wants. That's what Jesus wanted. He didn't want them to be in unbelief or in doubt or to have questions. So what did he do? He opened their eyes, opened their hearts, opened their minds to uh, the scriptures and explained them about all the things that had happened and were going on. It was always about, about him. And he wanted them to know that. So what was the response? What was the work they were given to do? He's risen. He's appeared. We, we've seen him. We've seen the reports. Now what? Well, the last part of all this is Jesus gives them a commission. He gives them a work to do. That is literally to go and tell. To go and preach and proclaim repentance and remission of sins. Their message was repentance. About the remission, the forgiveness of sins in the name of Jesus. Go back here. We're in Luke chapter 24. Look at verse 47. Luke, Luke chapter 24 and verse 47. Verse 46, he says, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. I love what he says in verse 48, And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Sounds like the day of Pentecost and what happens there, which we can deal with later. But that's, that's what he says. Your message is to go and preach about the repentance, about the remission of sins. We know the Great Commission in Matthew 28, don't we? Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. That's what, that's what we are to do. Go, go and tell. Go and tell what you've seen and heard. Go and tell to others what you know, what you've experienced. What about us? Yeah, we weren't there, were we? We didn't get a chance to put our hands in his nail prints or, or examine all the evidence of, of Jesus. We weren't there. But guess what we do have? We have the message of salvation. We have God's plan of salvation. We have the word of God. What's our commission? The same as theirs. To go. To go into all the world and to preach, to proclaim, to share the good news of Jesus Christ. I want to show you another interesting connection here as, as we get ready to close this thing out. In Luke chapter 24, look with me at the last two verses. Luke chapter 24, uh, verses 52 and 53. And while you're looking at that, I want to see how nimble your fingers are. Put your finger, your thumb over in Acts chapter 2, the last verse of Acts chapter 2. 
because we're going to go right to that one. So I'll give you a second to do that. Find Luke chapter 24, verse 52 and 53. It's the last two verses of the Gospel of Luke. All right? When you find Luke 24, the very end of it, last two verses, 52 and 53, put your thumb there and then find Acts chapter 2, verse 47. Again, the last two verses of Luke 24, and then the last verse of Acts chapter 2. You got it? Good job. I hear pages turning. You have no idea how encouraging that is to a, to a preacher or a Bible class teacher. Luke chapter 24 and verse 52 and 53 says this. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. Acts chapter 2, verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Very, very similar in response and, and what's going on. Praising God, worshiping God. But I like that verse in Acts chapter 2, verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people. That is, those who are members of the church and those who are not members of the church just yet had favor with all the people. But notice what the rest of that verse says. And the Lord added to their number, to the church daily, those who are being saved. Go and tell. Share the gospel message. There's one final tidbit that I really can't. It's almost like having a having a, a Sunday and not putting the whipped cream and the, the topping and the sprinkles and the cherry on the top. So we got to put the cherry on the top of all of this. I want you to hear what Jesus tells Peter uh, as, as they have breakfast together in John chapter 21. Because it's something you and I can, can take to heart as well. Sometimes we get so focused and so worked up and concerned about what other people are doing or not doing, what other people may be thinking or or just focused on other people. But here in John chapter 21, Jesus tells Peter to focus on himself. Don't, don't worry about what others are going to do. You worry about you. And you do what I'm telling you to do. And we're in John chapter 21, verse 19. Peter's been restored, reinstated, if you will. He denied Jesus three, three times, so Peter's questioned him about his love three times. All right, so here, zoom in with me. John chapter 21 uh, and verse number, number 19. And verse 19 uh, says this. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, Jesus said to Peter, follow me. He's heard that before. Follow me. Verse 20, then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? And Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? Can't you almost see Peter turning around? Jesus, what about him? What about him? Verse 22, Jesus said to him, Jesus said to Peter, if... I will that he remain till I come. What is that to you? You follow me. Jesus has just told Peter, don't worry about him. Don't worry about anyone else. You follow me. And that got me to thinking. Aren't you glad that on the day of judgment, you're not going to be accountable for other people? What someone else has done or not done? I'm glad to know that when I stand before God, the only one i got to give an account for is myself. And so Jesus is telling Peter, you follow me. Don't worry about him. You follow me. And so Paul would tell us in Romans 14 and verse 12, so each of us shall give an account of himself unto God. Yes, it's discouraging sometimes uh, to, to watch and to see or hear other Christians not doing and not, not being active and involved. And I believe Jesus would also tell us, as he told Peter, you follow me. Don't worry about someone else. You follow me. So that's really my question for all of us tonight. Are you and I following Jesus? 
We can't, can't get caught up so much in what someone else is doing or, or not doing. We need to begin with ourselves and make sure that we are following Jesus. Making sure that we are doing what Jesus would have us to do. So as a disciple tonight, as, as a Christian, are we? Are you, am I, doing what God has called each and every one of us to do individually? Again, don't worry about the person sitting next to you or behind you or anywhere else for that matter. As Jesus told Peter, you follow me. That individual responsibility, individual accountability. So what are we doing with all of this? I know that's probably been a lot today. What are we doing with, with all of, of what God has given to us, not just in the gospel accounts, but in his entire word? What are we doing with it? It is absolutely good news. And what do we do with good news? We share it. Are we sharing it with our lives? Are we sharing it with our words when we have the opportunity? Church, there's work to do. So guess what that means? We got to get busy. We got to get busy and don't really worry about someone else and others. Right now, tonight, we need to begin with ourselves. Am I doing what God wants me to do? Am I following Him? If I am, wonderful, wonderful. Can you be more faithful? Can, can, can you grow and improve? If you can, look for those ways and be the very best that you can be. Then we can be a good encouragement to others to join and to Get off the pew, get out of the grandstands and get into the game. Get into the battle with us. But begin with yourself tonight. We sing a song to encourage. If there's a way that we can help you as brothers and sisters in Christ, if we can encourage you, if we can come alongside of you, pray with you, pray for you, just let us know how. Maybe tonight you've never obeyed the gospel. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Would you be willing to repent of your sins, confess your faith in Christ? And then be baptized, having your sins washed away. Whatever your need is tonight, will you come as we stand together and sing?